Greetings, Race Community. Brent coming in live with today's guest, David Bennett, who is the Senior Vice President for Development and Alumni Relations at Howard University. Welcome, David. Brent, it's good to see you. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this the last couple of weeks. Well, this was uh, somewhat spontaneous following an opportunity we had to meet for the first time in person at the Case Summit in Chicago in early July. It is let's call it late August as we record this. And uh, we were connected by way of Josh Newton, our, our friend uh, who leads uh, advancement at Emory. And I was just really struck by our, our quick uh, conversation there. And it was uh, a no brainer to welcome you to the, uh, the podcast. Well, I, I appreciate it. I've listened to a bunch of episodes before we had the chance to meet there. I think you've had some of the most compelling leaders and Small world story, Josh, before he was at Emory, as you know, was at the University of Connecticut. He held the position my father created as the first VP of development at UConn in 1981. And that's how we were first introduced by a mutual friend that knew that connection between us. And from there, we've become close colleagues and great friends. So that's sort of a thanks, dad moment. I mean, I love it. Very unexpected. Well, let's uh, learn a little bit more about that story, about your uh, family uh, background and the fact that you are a second generation fundraiser, which hasn't happened too many times on this show, given how relatively young the professionalization of the sector has been. Uh, as you know, I've been asking most of my guests uh, to just share a little bit about your own journey to higher education, which is often formative in creating you know, the connection and passion that we all feel towards the space today. So take me back to David, junior year of high school. Who was that guy? Where was he? What was he into? And what led him to the University of Virginia? So David, junior in high school, was in a town of about 43,000 people during the week and 8,000 people on the weekends. It was a small, at the time, kind of backwater town of Storrs, Connecticut, where the University of Connecticut was located. And my family moved there from Omaha, where I was born, in 1981, as my dad became the first president of the Yukon Foundation and VP for Development at the university. So my introduction to fundraising as the youngest of three boys is once my brothers went to college, if I would suffer wearing a blue blazer for 30 minutes at alumni reception or brunch, I got 50 yards line seats at the football game, or I got to sit mid court at Big East games when St. John's and Georgetown and Syracuse were everything. So my introduction was being polite in a blazer for 30 minutes. And it was 30 years later, I realized my father brought me so, as an excuse so he could leave the cocktail party early and get us home. Uh, I, when I was 16, a junior year, I started working in the university's call center, calling alums for their first comprehensive campaign, and have pretty much had a paid job in the space ever since. Um, I did that through high school. In college, I was... Uh, David, can I just working. ask? Yeah. Um, you might be the youngest call center worker. I mean, we're talking <laughs> almost borderline child labor law uh, issues. I, I'm not going to go back and check the the statutes, but I mean, 16 years hammering the phones, that's next level. Day I turned 16 was uh, when it was legal in Connecticut. So I worked the university's call center for men, did it in most, college. Most kids are like yeah. running out to get the driver's license and you're no, 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 give me the headset. It, it was air conditioned, it paid 50 cents more an hour than working at the Wawa did. Seemed like a pretty good gig to me. And so take me back to, I mean, that is a right high velocity job yep. and you get people across the spectrum who love the place, never want to hear from the place again, everything in between. It's one thing to want the job because it pays 50 cents more. Um, it's another thing to actually enjoy it. I mean, did you enjoy it at the time? I did. It was, it was a, UConn was a place that I, it's literally where I grew up. My high school was the university high school. So I was, I took, was taking classes college classes my junior and senior year in UConn classrooms. And so I had this affinity to the institution, but obviously a very different experience than a 25-year-old or 35 or 55-year-old graduate. And so you're right, you heard happy and sad, and that professor was a jerk, and I want my kids to go there, and the whole range of how people responded to their alma mater. And the and it really, you're right, was a lot of feeling. There's very little transactional in that moment. It's a lot of 
how the UConn experience made those alum feel, whether it was five years ago or 50 years ago. So based on everything you've said so far in the story, I would guess the next step is to attend the University of Connecticut. Uh, it was. Uh, I had two, my parents wrote two deposit checks for me, one to the University of Virginia and one to the University of Connecticut. And um, the call center director was a UVA grad. And I'd heard about UVA before, but she was just a year or two out of school and so had all the energy and enthusiasm that people who loved their alma mater and their college experience have. And then my night job, my senior year, was I was the waiter at the president's house at UConn. So when he would do dinners or football tailgates or whatever else, I was doing that. John had been director of admissions and subsequently went to be president of UVA. So President Castine also encouraged me to look at Charlottesville. So it literally came down to April 15th at the mailbox. And I chose to go to school in Charlottesville. Which is an absolutely beautiful, amazing place with uh, an incredibly, you know, passionate and uh, committed alumni community. And I have many dear friends, both uh, who work at UVA and, and also uh, alumni. Uh, did you love it right away? I mean, that's a big change from Stores Connecticut. Um, what was the adjustment period like? Um, I, I did. I, I loved it right away. And I, I realized that I'm still growing now because of the experience and some of what I learned then. Um, I did. I fell in with a really good group of people really quickly um, that were hardworking and smart and supportive. Uh, I maybe got a, in too, a little too focused on the student leadership and student self-governance side. And in hindsight, could have spent a little more time in that nuclear theory and foreign policy class. Um, uh, but but for me, it was a, a transformational experience. I still, I, I still, my closest friends, many of them are from that cycle. My best friends in college got married. Their daughter moved to DC last week and is coming for a cookout on Sunday. Uh, it just, for me, was one of those experiences that really helped me begin to build the frame in which I would try and understand myself over the rest of my life. So you had like, I don't know, 10 years of advancement experience by the time you were 18, let's call it. Did you have the uh, advancement side hustle going on while you were balancing academics and the student leadership? I did. I, I worked the alumni call center uh, for a couple of years and then became the, the, they had a student member of whether it was the board of visitors or the college foundation or whatever that structure was. So actually did volunteer work with those principal gift donors and with with others would welcome them when they came to town. Uh, so yeah, I, I did I did work pretty consistently in the space in college. And you're studying foreign affairs, which yep. um, I don't know, maybe that leads you down to foreign service, the FBI, who knows, uh, or it could lead you uh, in a different path, which is my understanding was was the case. How did you think about going from uh, this very unique level of experience as a second generation, potentially aspiring fundraiser, doing your academic work, doing your leadership work. How do you translate that into what am I actually going to do when I graduate? So when I graduated, I said there were two things I was not going to do. And I said this publicly and everyone who knew me knew that. I wasn't going to be a fundraiser and I wasn't going to work in politics. And nine weeks later, I was a major gift officer for one of the national political parties in Washington, D.C., because that's the job that I could find. And I was interested in politics, um, was interested in campaigns, thought that it would be more from the political side. But people looked at me and said, I can put you over here. And so I my thought it was a foot in the door to get me into campaigns and elections and the federal government because I had that fundraising background. So I... I stumbled into the career in a different way than most of us stumble into this career. It was early in your career, um, but I am just curious to get your perspective on the similarities and differences as it relates to political fundraising. We really, as a company, have just not ever gone there. We don't have much experience um, with the space. I personally don't have a lot of exposure to it, other than the cycles are so fast. And it is literally make or break 
Whereas it does feel like sometimes if we could instill some of the political fundraising sense of urgency into higher ed, right. it could be beneficial. I, I think that that's what I learned. And it was, it's like going to graduate school because there is no tomorrow. You can never repeat today because I worked primarily in campaigns. My national party work was short and campaigns, you know how many days to the election. You know how many days to the big game. If you don't have a good practice on Tuesday, you never get Tuesday back. And I, one of the reasons I never thought I would work in higher ed and didn't until very you know, relatively late in my career was because higher ed 25 years ago is very different than higher ed now. And it was a game of how do I get 1% more out of the parents fund? How do I get 1% more out of this? And obviously the field has changed tremendously now, but I can tell you that sense of urgency uh, is something that particularly over the last two and a half years here at Howard University has just been, has just been vital to allowing us to do what we do because you know, you learn in politics, you never get that day back. They don't push the election back one more day because you didn't pull it off. And it's also, that is a wildly different space as I think you know better than anybody in the higher ed space is the digital online community component didn't really exist at the time. I had an AOL email address when I was on a campaign. I mean, that's what that's what we were working with. So it really was whether it was the major donor or the annual fund, you just, you couldn't miss a deadline. And it, it was amazing professional training for me. When did you first get exposed to Odell, Sims and Associates? And what is OSA for the folks who aren't as familiar? So uh, when I, my first U.S. Senate campaign was in Maryland for a figure who was very well known to the party, had been out of politics for 20 years, was coming back. He brought in, his, an, as an advisor to him, a guy named Bob Odell. Bob had worked on every political presidential campaign in the party for 35 years. Bob had done everything. And I ended up working with Bob as an advisor. He then said to me when that campaign was over, I've got a friend who's running for the Senate in Nebraska. Do you know anything about Nebraska or have any interest in going there? I said, funny, I grew up there. And so I, that's how I got to know Bob, set up a U.S. Senate primary campaign in Nebraska. When it was time to come back, Bob's executive assistant was on a 30-day leave. So he said, you can sit at my desk and send my faxes for me. Again, that's when this was. And you can use my phone to try and get a job. And seven days later, Bob and his partner, John Sims, asked if I would stay at the firm, which I did for about eight and a half years. They, are a, they have two or three lines of business, but MySpace was a boutique consulting firm for nonprofit clients. I took them out of politics into nonprofit. So $125 million capital campaign for a science center in New Jersey, uh, the Smithsonian's 150th anniversary tour, kind of a, a range of programs, primarily in that space, uh, integrated capital campaigns, um, not residential council, but strategy and design. No real intersection with higher education again at this point. Correct. But then that ultimately led you to uh, move, let's call it in-house and, and start uh, really in your direct development career uh, with um, experiences at United Cerebral Palsy, Cerebral Palsy of America, Safe Kids Worldwide, and then uh, National Geographic. So three very different organizations. Um, mm -hmm. I'm curious when you think about each of those um, stops, what your kind of favorite uh, memory is, and then maybe one lesson learned. Why don't we start with cerebral palsy? So cerebral palsy is the, is the lesson learned. Uh, the For years and years, one of, the, well, one of the founders of United Cerebral Palsy had a child with cerebral palsy and also owned ABC. So he launched his own telethon nationally on ABC to raise money. And what UCP's national office did was really serve to produce that and then distribute money out to its chapters across the country. Um, 
the problem with that is the kind of ethical construct of how those telethons worked. If you think about it, it's Jerry Lewis crying and there, but for the grace of God go I, and nothing about the inherent dignity or worth of a person with a disability. And so UCP got out of that business. The lesson learned was UCP national office at that point didn't really have a compelling reason for being. It was being because it had always been there. And that was a narrative that was really hard to take to the donor community because what impact we were going to have on people with disabilities, or communities with disabilities that you wouldn't get from investing in the North Carolina chapter or the San Diego chapter, we didn't have a, a compelling value proposition. We were a good think tank, but that's not the same branding as you're on in 40 ABC markets for 12 hours with your corporate messaging. Uh, and so that was lesson learned there. Great work, amazing work in the field, dedicated people. But if you don't have a compelling philanthropic narrative, you just, it's not going to work in the long term. And so after a couple of years, I, I left and went to a place where I thought we could build that. Thank you for the candor. Um, it's, you know, uh, it, it's really valuable to learn from those sorts of uh, lessons, which we don't often hear about. Tell me about Safe Kids and why did you feel more compelled in that? context. So I, the Safe Kids experience in approaching it really has shaped and continued on to how I've approached every job I've had since. And that is Safe Kids was an organization that people didn't understand that had developed a series of interventions to prevent childhood injury and death. Simple. But they're the folks that advocated for car seat laws and did bike helmet training and did it around the world. And they had very culturally specific locally designed interventions that what you're doing in Nepal is different than what you're doing in North Carolina. And the, the risks are different, the economic structure is different, the cultural structure is different. And it worked. They would reduce, they had been a key player in reducing childhood injury in the US by 42% in 20 years. And this numbers are staggering. They weren't telling the story that way. Nobody understood it. And what I realized is something that I think I bring to the table is recognizing that a pilot has worked, that the data is there, but the organization just doesn't know how to structure a message around philanthropic impact and doesn't really know how to build the team to deliver on that. And that's what we did at Safe Kids until in the years up to the 2008 economic crash, we had grown revenue by... 35% a year for three years in a row. Uh, we had supported our local chapters, doubling the revenue they were raising at the local level for local programming. Uh, and it was all it was all because the, the scientists, the policymakers, the public health pros had shown they had an answer and they had a better answer than anybody else. And people who cared about those issues looked at the data and said, wow, that's that's amazing. That's my best way of solving that problem. And that for me is the same thing at National Geographic and is the same thing here at Howard. I got to be honest, when I was doing my research about safe kids, it struck me as something that I would have guessed would be actually very hard to raise money for. And I say that because who is the constituency? You know, who is passionate enough about keeping kids safe from a whole set of possible injuries that it's going to rise to the top of their philanthropic priorities relative to cerebral palsy or National Geographic or UVA or UConn, et cetera. And so I am curious, like, how do you kind of fight for share of wallet in a context like that, which literally everybody can empathize with the broad objectives but that is different than stepping up philanthropically. Absolutely. And I think it was narrow casting who we thought our philanthropic set was and really looking, as we talked in another context, person to person about how do we build that network. So uh, unfortunately, as an example, we had a, a mother, a great friend of ours who lost their child in a specific kind of pool accident, pool incident that was obviously incredibly devastated loss to their family. She partnered with us, used her voice to get state and then federal regulations passed around certain building requirements and codes for swimming pools. Low cost, not difficult, 
saves about 120 kids a year and will for all time in this country. We were then able to look at some product manufacturers who would fund public education campaigns around the new work. So, you know, your kid's car seat may have been put in by someone at your local firehouse. My colleagues taught them how to do that. We trained the 32,000 licensed people in America who know how to do that. That's really important to motor vehicle insurance companies. That's really important to car seat manufacturers. That's really important to others. So a lot of times it was, we were delivering to your family and millions of families a year at scale, mission impact that then allowed corporate and foundation partners to say, yeah, we want to continue to enable you to do that. It was just a different way of looking at who the donor audience was. But yeah, d- direct mail for safe kids is not really a long-term future business. Almost um, you know, part, part lobbying, part philanthropy, uh, advocacy, et cetera. And then you went from, uh, you know, a brand that I was less familiar with to a brand that almost everybody knows really well, National Geographic. Um, And while people know the brand really well, I bet a lot of people would not realize there is a nonprofit fundraising aspect to it. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, So just tell me about that experience and what was great about it? What was hard? So you're, you're exactly right. That's, that's what I found attractive was I would get asked, but I mean, like giving you money to send photographers and pay for their cameras, uh, where we had, for example, a colleague who had developed bar none, the most successful ocean protection program in the world, statistically peer reviewed all over the place. Nobody knew about it. It was saving, I think it saved something like 12,000 square kilometers of the ocean of the most pristine parts of the world. We just didn't talk about National Geographic that way as a science and conservation organization that leverages the power of storytelling and visual imagery to make this work compelling. And when we framed the work that way and, and started to change the institutional narrative, yeah, do most people know because their dentist or their mother had the magazine on their table? Absolutely. But even the magazine started to evolve its coverage to highlight the work of some of the scientists and the impact that it was having. So that's where we were able to go again to a very different audience of people and say, this is planet saving, this is path breaking, this is diversifying the field of science by gender and national origin of scientists, which means we're studying different things that we didn't study before. It opened up a dramatically different audience. And then we could distill that into a low dollar ask that was, this is pristine seats. This is photo arc that's logging photographs of every known species on earth. And that became something that your $25 a month became a compelling personal investment for you, where the $5 million corporate investment in ocean protection was for an entirely different set of reasons, but everyone was investing into the storytelling to save the planet narrative that was just, this, again, it was a philanthropic story that, that National Geographic had never told. You joined National Geographic at a really interesting time. One, it was basically the exact minute that I was starting Evertrue. Uh, That's not why it's interesting. But part of the reason that I started Evertrue was because there was this massive wave of change being driven by two real trends, mobile technology and social media platforms. And you were at National Geographic when this wave was uh, breaking And I took a quick peek today before we started recording, and National Geographic now has 237 million followers. Mm -hmm. I'll say that again, 237 million followers on Instagram. And I'm just curious, like, as you think about being there at a time of such, let's call it technology and social media adoption, did it matter? Did you all realize what that might do for the ability to even further amplify the brand so that it's not just when I see it at the dentist's office. 
So the it's the number one non-celebrity brand on Instagram and has been since 120 days after Insta launched. Uh, the brilliant team of people that curate it. And they've done a really good job at tying it back to mission because they will do, they'll let photograph National Geographic photographers do takeovers. And so if Enrique Sala shows pictures from the expedition he is on in the Galapagos and shows what he's trying to protect and shows him meeting with local indigenous people to get their buy-in and understanding that the plan that he's talking about reflects their interests and their desires and their needs. Hundreds of millions of images are seen in that day by people who are hearing Enrique in his voice with his work. When Kriti Karant shows tigers in the Western Ghats in Kazaranga, she is talking there about human-animal interaction. And as cities grow and as, po- as animal populations shrink, how do we accommodate humanity and wildlife in urban markets? Two very different environmental questions, but there's some good looking cats and there's some good looking turtles. And, and that is absolutely something that National Geographic, I think, has done well. And, and most of that since I left, because that was five or six years ago, it, it absolutely is reinforcing that these are not just pretty pictures, they're important pictures and they tell important stories. In a, you know, fair to say that social media has taken a lot of blame, rightfully so, for polarization and, and all of that. Um, I feel like we can all get behind the Nat Geo content, that is for and, sure. And again, I, and I have no credit due for it, and I'm a thousand percent proud of my colleagues and leaders over there who have done that. They've been so, um, so focused in maintaining the quality knowing that the quality will bring the audience and leveraging it in appropriate ways to advance uh, the brand and the mission both. And so with all of that, uh, we come to you having the opportunity to join Howard University in 2017. Most people are listening to us right now. So it might not be obvious that you are a white guy Mm -hmm. and that is a characteristic that is somewhat atypical within the HBCU advancement leadership community. And I don't want to go too far down that path, but I think it's just worth highlighting because I know that it has helped shape your perspective on diversity, equity, inclusion, from an angle um, that is not very common, uh, that just not too many people have had the opportunity to experience. And so tell me what led you to think about higher education in general, if you did, and then specifically how the opportunity at Howard got onto your radar and what your perspective was on whether you might be the right fit given uh, the objectives at Howard. Oh, I was absolutely confident I would be a completely terrible fit, Brett. Absolutely confident that I was the wrong guy for the I job. I thought you were going down the path. I was confident I would be the right fit. So no, I, I was down. absolutely dead set against this. Um, JT Saunders, a now chief development diversity officer at Corn Ferry, called me because he knew I was in the market for a new role and said, I got a crazy idea. And he's an HBCU guy, grad himself. He's not a, a Howard grad, but I believe a Morehouse grad. And um, and I'm like, JT, we've met in person. I'm not the right guy for this. But JT worked for a woman named Davina Gamble, who is not only one of the loveliest people you meet, but is the national co-chair of the nonprofit practice for Corn Ferry. Davina wants to have a meeting. It's very, it's wonderful. And it gives me a chance to hopefully pitch for another job that she's got. Davina essentially tells me that, no, 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 don't worry about it. I don't want it. I just don't, I don't know how a white person is credibly the second most visible spokesman, not just for an HBCU, but for the flagship HBCU. And you know, in in the roles that my colleagues and I have, the president's the most visible spokesman and it's the VP of development. And I, I just, I didn't, I just didn't see how that would work. And, and Davina, ultimately just said, well, do me a favor. I understand you're not applying for the job, but do me a favor. And you can't tell a partner at Corn Ferry, I'm not going to do you a favor when you're looking for a job. So she said, 
I'll tell the president that you don't want the job, but we think you have a profile that is different than what he thinks he wants for the job. We'd love if you would do us the favor and spend 15 minutes with Dr. Frederick and just talk to him about your background and how you perceive the job. I said, great. Happened the development committee chair was here that day. So I met Dr. Morris first, now the chair of our board. And then I meet with the president. 13 minutes into the call, president says, okay, so you're going to be my VP. And, and, and I, I inter- only time I've ever interrupted him since. I said, I'm sorry, Dr. Frederick, didn't they tell you I'm not applying for this job? And he said, yeah, yeah, we'll figure that part out. And, and figure it out, we did. And uh, I had very frank conversations with our chair, I'm who sorry, is a Howard. Did, yeah. What did you say in those 13 minutes, man? Uh, <laughs> again, I was a different profile. And I think um, race is probably one of the least different things about my professional background in higher ed. I think it's because I was bringing this entrepreneurial building aspect. And he was looking at a 150-year-old institution that raised 8 to $14 million a year. And that was just, I mean, total funds, all sources, all uses was 8 to $14 million a year. And he just knew that that couldn't be where Howard was supposed to be. Um, and so I think he saw the, the building and the entrepreneurial work I'd done in different sectors as more relevant than anything else. And I had very frank conversations with him. He's a three-time graduate of Howard. Uh, I had very frank conversations with the chair of the board, the chair of the development committee, and the late Vernon Jordan, who is chair of Merida, and, and a bunch of folks. And in, in, in came back to the same things I learned at Safe Kids and at National Geographic is that Howard's philanthropic narrative stopped at Thurgood Marshall and Jesse Norman, and we thumbtacked on Taraji P. Henson. We were not talking about the contemporary excellence of what today's students and today's faculty are doing and how this institution is an engine like literally no other in the country on a drive towards social and racial justice in America and increasingly in the world. That philanthropic narrative, I believe was uniquely powerful. And just in my president got that. He understood that because that was his Howard experience. He spent 30 years on this campus. He, but, but brings a surgeon scientist's willingness to look at data and be challenged. He, that, that was, his experience was today's magic about the place. And we, I believed as the world was beginning before George Floyd and before Breonna Taylor and before COVID and health disparities, the world was already starting to say, you know, we think this is something we need to pay attention to. That the DEIJ was moving beyond just an HR function to a boardroom conversation. And I, I've, I have not seen before, nor have I seen now, a more effective, more efficient, more powerful solution provider in that space than young women and young men armored in Howard degrees. And, and ultimately, I, I, I knew I'd taken risks and failed and made bad choices in the past and had picked up and moved on in my career. Um, and I just found what, what the president had been doing, what my been what, what the colleagues of that era had done to move Howard's forward, to move its actual results to higher territory. I just, I knew that was important and I believed it was marketable philanthropically. And cutting to the chase to go from eight to $14 million a year being raised when you were evaluating the opportunity to back to back years of I believe $170 million. Not sure if there has ever been a growth story like that in the history of higher education advancement. Maybe somebody knows if you're listening, if you can share an example of more growth than that, that isn't just a one-off one mega gift, I would love to hear it. And there is a lot that has gone into that, a lot of macro factors. And I would imagine it has been an experience that A, maybe feels like a lifetime, B, has probably (laughs) felt uh, both incredibly um, inspirational while having 
a front row seat to some of the most gut-wrenching moments of the last decade and everything in between. And so um, with some of the time we have left, I would just love to kind of understand the different phases of the experience so far and where you see things going from here. Uh, it, it has been the, the most extraordinarily unanticipated journey and particularly to go through the last two and a half years with my team and my colleagues here at a historically black university has been um, has been really, really remarkable. We, we started, I'd say the first phase was from when I arrived until about February 2020, so the first couple of years. And that was literally, we were running on a database that I told a colleague of mine what it was, and he laughed out loud because it hadn't been supported by the vendor in 10 years. It literally was a three by five card on a server in my closet. Yes, and at that time, it was a server in my closet. Um, we did the very rudimentary work, CRM conversion, looking at most urgent hires, getting the president in front of maybe some different folks that he had seen before. Um, I had one and a half donor facing fundraisers when I started for the university. Uh, and it was really just, just how do we get there? And we, we had a staff, I inherited and a staff. Point of reference around 100,000 alumni. Around 100,000 alumni. When I got here, we were an $800 million institution and we had a one and a half donor facing fundraisers. Um, and, and what, I, what I, what I believed and I had been so thrilled that I was correct is the team that had been here, only one or two of them had ever worked in philanthropy at another organization, but they bleed bison blue. They, they own our values. They own our mission. They have credibility filters that are second to none. And if it's, if it, if it's right for Howard, they know it. And if it's wrong for Howard, they know it. And not because they're outdated or in some old school way, but they simply, Howard is their lived experience. And so for me, it was an issue of, of not getting a new team, but blending new team members that may bring different skills and experience with existing team members that bring experience and skills and brand and mission and historic knowledge. And so that's what we've been trying to do over the last couple of years. And I could say that only members of the team, I, I believe the only members of the team that were here when I came that have left retired. Um, and we managed to do that. It's one of the things that I'm most grateful to my kind of existing team uh, was the trust and willingness to say, this is not a clean house operation. This is just build on an addition and maybe tear some walls down and make the kitchen a little more open. Uh, and that's what we did. So that was that first phase was a lot of why none of us get into this business. I mean, I, I know you love data conversions, but most of us could probably get past it. Um, but it was a ton of hard work, but uh, really good work. And it also gave me a window to develop my Howard story. And I'm a big believer in fundraising that we all tell our own version of an institutional story. And I needed to get mine. It took you less than 13 minutes to hit it off with Dr. Frederick. I imagine it took more than 13 minutes to build trust with your team. Oh, I, I was interviewed by every single one of them before I was hired. I had five panel interviews with the staff. I met all of cabinet. Yeah, there, there was. And um, I mean, again, I was, as, I was as different as different could be. And again, I think not coming from higher ed, not coming from an HBCU, not coming from Howard, those were much more important questions for the team than was I white or black or something else. It was, are you going to get the culture as well as get our culture? And, and that I think was, was where there was curiosity, uh, but I think there was also, and I, again, I appreciate the grace of that curiosity and not the assumption that I wouldn't, um, that my team showed to me. And I think over time, um, I must have done enough to demonstrate to them that I, I do, um, I, I do in my own way align with Howard's values as they each in their own way align with them as well. And so phase one, sort of build the foundation and 
you know, really take that passion and commitment to the mission and start to build the professional um, kind of next level apparatus for fundraising, what was phase two? So either the end of phase one or the beginning of phase two, depending on how you count it, is our fiscal year is June 30th. From July 1 through March 15th, we closed four of the five largest gifts in Howard's 152-year history. So we were moving to a we had just come off a $38 million year from that eight to 12. And so we had, were demonstrating to the institution and to the board, who's been incredibly supportive of this work, that this is not flash in the pan. This is a curve and we need to build into it. So at our January 2020 board retreat, the board made a five-year will commitment to invest in fundraising at Howard to try and grow it to not where our peer groups are staffed, but at least to a place where we could sustain it. And so we had that confidence. Uh, that was the day before we sent out a university comm, alerting folks that we were tra tracking a WHO, WHO report about something happening in Wuhan. And six weeks later, the world shut down. And so we had the, the first issue of, as a university administrator, how do we get our kids off campus safely? How do we get our faculty safe? How do we move to online? HBCUs tend to serve a socioeconomically more disadvantaged population than most PWIs. So how do we get our kids' devices and tablets to learn? How do we get them Wi-Fi hotspots and just a whole of university approach to wrap as much love around these kids and faculty as we could to get them through the semester? Um, but my boss, again, he's a university president, but his side hustle is his practice in cancer surgery whose research specialty is twofold. It's highly complex GI cancers, and it's uh, unintended and implicit bias in medicine. And so as a black surgeon university president, he got a ton of access to national media opportunities um, to tell important stories because that's right as the death rate in COVID was nothing that we didn't know about. It was just showing to a lot of people who'd never thought about it, the, the fundamental health disparities of black and brown communities led directly to higher death rates and the economic circumstance led directly to higher infection rates. He's a very passionate, very well-informed speaker on that. So he was on Meet the Press four times. He, his visibility skyrocketed. And that started to get people saying, well, how can we help on the health disparity side? So we got funding to open the first free COVID testing labs east of the river in Washington, DC, which is a historically black, historically underinvested in part of our community. We, we opened it in partnership with the city before anybody did. Um, those kinds of things, a lot of people were saying, we think he's on to something. And we were growing into that space and growing into energy when George Floyd was murdered. And the second part of that was just the incredible intensity of the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, Black Lives Matter summer, of the demand by employees that corporations and foundations become engaged differently. Uh, that was the second part of that, uh, which was, as you alluded to, both of those things are extremely hard. My team of then about 50 lost several cousins to COVID in the first 120 days. And we're all on Zoom and Teams trying to have this conversation. And everybody else but me on the call knows somebody who's died of COVID. And how do you manage a team empathetically, thoughtfully in this new online environment and realize that there's work that's got to be done? It just, I may need to do your work for you today because you may not be in the headspace to go. And then again, Black Lives Matter Summer added a whole other layer to that. But then the third part of that phase was then Senator Kamala Harris, a Howard alumna, being named the vice presidential nominee of the Democratic Party. That brought suddenly a lot of joy and energy and uplift to the community when it was desperately in need of it. And that's something that Howard alums really gathered around. So I think to me, that first 18 months of COVID was the second phase, and that was the bill to hear. And then the third has been the maintaining in a hybrid environment. Uh, we're seeing, unfortunately, from the Foundation Center and, and, and other sources, 
really depressing data about the return of investment in racial justice initiatives by large donors back to levels below 2019's level. Uh, we are fortunate at Howard that we've been able to continue to make a compelling story that's allowed us to continue on that upward trajectory. But I think this is really the, the next phase and we're in this for a while. Mackenzie Scott, Sean Diddy Combs, there are a lot of celebrities that have rallied around the Howard mission as well. In addition to, I'm sure, just broad-based, more grassroots support from uh, a passionate alumni community. And you hear about the growth in revenue and the success that is being experienced. Um, then there is the financial aspect of that. I mean, I read a recent Bloomberg article where it has literally changed the bond ratings of Howard University. I mean, that the, the intersection of philanthropy and financial health and viability of the institution, that needle has been moved in a, in a way that, at a pace that is very uncommon for this sector. Correct. And, and what's been particularly advantageous is my colleagues in enrollment management were looking at the drivers of the discount rate and attracting larger classes still with high Pell, rate, Pell Grant needs, but also just looking at that discount rate. And it helps that my healthcare colleagues were rationalizing operations at the hospital to bring those back into break even. So each of what used to be the only two levers we had were moving in the right direction. And then yes, we added philanthropy as a, now as a persistent revenue source. And that has, uh, that has led to, I think, three or four ratings increases in the last three years for Howard. Uh, we did a several hundred million dollar bond issue, thankfully, the week before the invasion of Ukraine that 18 months earlier, our bankers told, her not e told us not even to think about it until 2025. So it has accelerated a lot of our ability to renew. And so we've talked a lot about the past. Tell me about the present, the future, your team. Where do you all go from here? Um, I, I'm so excited about the future. I, I can't even tell you. I, um, I worry for the sector, and by sector, I mean HBCU sector in particular, um, because a lot of our organizations are small and we're kind of on life support. And some of these investments they received were really, really critical for them. I worry still about some of our sisters and brothers and their viability, particularly public HBCUs that have been aggressively mistreated in the financial and policy perspective in their states. Um, but I'm excited for Howard. I'm excited for Howard because we're growing. For the first time, if you come visit us and Howard in 18 months, I'm going to have four cranes on this campus. And we are renewing our core campus infrastructure with the biggest renewal project we've had in a hundred years. And as my president says, we don't build rock walls, we build labs. We don't build fun things. We're not competing with other schools to come because we've got the best four-story dining hall with an atrium. That's not Howard. We're gonna come here because you're gonna do world-class research as an undergrad in an issue that affects people of the African diaspora. And you're gonna do it with a top-notch endowed faculty member. We're going to put a billion dollars into our healthcare enterprise because we graduate 40% of all Black doctors in America. And as an undergraduate institution, we send more Black doctors to medical school nationally than any other institution. And my graduating class is 2,000 people compared to an Ohio State and Indiana and Michigan. Not, uh, only, and, yep. not only is there that strength, but just as a point of reference, top three employers of Howard University alumni, Amazon, Microsoft, Google. Absolutely. With a set of names beyond that. A absolutely. I mean, we it's the the and that's my story about the contemporary relevance of Howard is these kids, these faculty members, what they're doing today and what they're going to do tomorrow and what the ones who are 10 and 20 and 30 years out are doing now is is game changing. That this is not a we told a backward looking story. And as the sector, we often tell a backward-looking story. The forward-looking story, based on legacy, 
is the much more interesting one to me. And I think we're only doubling down on that. We're opening what will be the largest center for clinical trials at a black medical center because we were a test site for a vaccine that has cleared FDA approval that doesn't need zero Celsius storage. So it will be a solution for poorer countries around the world for getting shots in arms that don't appeal to large multinational corporations that can sell to the West. We know that we have physicians, nurses, dentists, techs who are culturally competent, who can build confidence among African-Americans enrolling in scientific tests and clinical tests, that it's for the right reasons, that this isn't Tuskegee. This is the right thing. That's going to scale up our knowledge of the African genome, of medical interventions, of pharmaceutical interventions, and how they affect people differently that will change millions of lives. And I just look at every part of this campus, and I see that. The thing that makes me most sad and most excited is our president has announced he will not renew his contract uh, when it's up next. That's very much his choice. The board would very much like him to stay. Uh, I, you heard my story. I came here because of him. Uh, there's no one else that could have gotten me to do this. But I'm also mindful of his kind of admonition that there are leaders for generations. And the same leader who gets you, you know, to the playoffs may not be the leader that gets you the World Series ring or gets you the Super Bowl trophy. Uh, he, is, he has moved Howard to a place that 11 years ago, if you had told someone we were going to be, they wouldn't have bothered to laugh because they would have just thought you were a lunatic. If you look at where we are, it makes me just really curious about where's next and where's beyond. I asked you, uh, we asked some questions in advance just to create some fodder for the discussion. And, and I asked, why, why should somebody want to work at your institution? And I'm going to read your response, which I don't often do, but you wrote, people should want to work at Howard because I know of no other place that does and will do more to advance racial and social justice in America. It's really powerful. You clearly believe that deeply. Um, are you hiring? And, um, and and tell me a little bit about your your colleagues. Yes, uh, David dot Bennett B E N N E T T at Howard dot edu. I answer my email myself. It doesn't go to anybody else. So anybody who's listening or watching, uh, we we want to hire all people of all types, of all backgrounds, of all lived experiences. That's important to us. Uh, we're building across the board and the board has made an investment and they're going to make, I think, another investment. But we're looking for everything from directors of development at school and college levels uh, to annual fund officers to donor stewardship teams. And, and I anticipate I'm going to hire 10 or 15 people a year for another five or six or seven years. And so if we don't have, it's something I've heard you say, Brett, if we don't have what you're looking for now, reach out anyway and introduce yourself and tell us what you are looking for. And when that opportunity comes up, we wanna be the first ones to give you a call. But um, but I really do believe um, this is and an I amazing place to down. If you're still listening, you would be so surprised how often we say that, how few people actually follow up, but the ones who do, it really stands out. If a couple of you, actually send David an email right now. Most people are gonna listen, think about it, not do it. For the ones who do, it can be the difference in one, just a great relationship and opportunity, you never know. Um, but I would just encourage everybody, LinkedIn, email, take that small step, um, even if nothing else comes of it, other than having one more um, kindred spirit uh, in, in your Rolodex. And if, if I can't hire you, if you're not a match or DC isn't a match for you, that's fine. Because I know my colleagues at Spelman and Morehouse and Emory, if you want to be in Atlanta and now Georgia Tech, if you want to be working at a large public school, we have a great colleague who just moved six weeks ago to Maryland. I Matt, Matt at UVA, my alma mater. I mean, there are all kinds of folks who are looking for people who approach our world of higher ed fundraising from a values-driven, mission-driven lens. And if you're coming from that, I guarantee we'll find you somebody where you live or where you want to be or in the sector you want to practice in. 
David, it has been uh, really a pleasure learning more about your journey and what uh, keeps you so fired up for the space. I look forward to continuing to get to know you. And I just want to say thanks for sharing with our audience. Brent, I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm enjoying the the comradeship that we're building. Um, you're, you all are clearly doing some fascinating things with a range of institutions. And it's just really been great to start this dialogue with you. And I appreciate it. No doubt. Well, everybody listening, please, uh, you know, take David up on the offer, shoot him a note, connect on LinkedIn. And if you have ideas for me, you know, feedback on the show, uh, people that we might want to consider um, as guests, definitely want that feedback. I'm not hard to find. So uh, with that, uh, just feeling really inspired and grateful for the conversation today. Uh, and I will uh, sign off with uh, David Bennett who leads development and alumni relations at Howard University in Washington, DC. Thanks, David, and take care, everybody. Mm -hmm.